sharing the slides. Alrighty. I am. Okay, great. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for one of our um, summer webinar series. Uh, today, we were gonna we are going to be talking about Legal Navigator. Um, our summer webinar series is all about um, self help websites and tools, um, and we're very excited to have two speakers with us today. Um, Glenn Rodden, who is Senior Program Counsel for Technology with the Legal Services Corporation, and um, Nalani Fujimori Kaina, who is the Executive Director of the Legal Aid Society of Hawaii. So um, thank you both so much for being here, and I'll pass it off to whoever's starting. Okay, Angela, that would be, uh, that would be I who is starting this. And so uh, welcome everybody. And uh, I hope everybody's having a good start of summer so far. Uh, Nailani and I wanna to talk to you about a legal navigator. That's a project that we've been working on for quite some time now. And uh, I'm gonna start with a short video that our public relations department put together at LSC that kind of gives you an overview. And then Nailani and I will go into some details. I hope we got it queued up so that the audio is okay. Have you heard about Legal Navigator? Do you know what it is? Legal Navigator is an online portal that guides self-represented litigants with civil legal projects, helpful content, and service providers for their state or locale. The goal of Legal Navigator is to simplify access to legal information and provide curated, high-quality information from trusted sources. The concept for Legal Navigator is to be more than a statewide website. It will make it easier for people with civil legal problems to get legal information so they can trust and understand, make a plan for a path forward, and share this plan with a reliable service provider. This is not a simple Google search. You can aggregate your state's trustworthy, verified, and reliable legal assistance resources all in one place. Each state can build on partnerships among legal aid providers, state courts, social services, private lawyers, and bar associations to contribute and manage content and resources. Here's what we do. Legal Navigator piloted in two states, Alaska and Hawaii. Each state oversaw its content, including topics, resources, and guided assistance. Each state concentrated on the subjects that were most important to them for the pilot and build guided assistance in those specific two to three focus areas. User testing has been done in both states and the results are encouraging. Users were excited about the service and the ability to have a curated experience. They trust the information on the site. They thought the site was very simple and the guided assistant was both easy to understand and easy to use. And users were happy that they had plenty of ways to share their content. With their I do, I do, uh... If you are looking to build a statewide portal, this could be a way to jumpstart your efforts. The code is open source and free to use. You can use Legal Navigator to expand the availability of trustworthy legal information in your locality, curate more tailored legal assistance information and action plans, and make referrals to service providers to provide further assistance. Innovation and technology are essential for the legal community to narrow the justice gap. For more information and to help you get started, email legalnavadmin at legalnav.org. Produced in partnership with the Legal Service Corporation's Board of Directors, Hawaii Justice Foundation, Alaska Court System, Microsoft, Pew Charitable Trusts, and Pro Bono Data. That gave you kind of a brief overview of the concept of Legal Navigator. Just to start out with, I want everybody to understand Legal Navigator is not designed to replace somebody's website. This is not supposed to replace the statewide website, the court's website, the bar's website, none of that. It was actually designed because there are so many different websites. And that's been one of the issues with all of those different websites. Where do people go for trusted information? You saw the, the photographs in the video from the ideation workshops that we did in Alaska and Hawaii. And one of the things that in both places, it was very important to people 
was that they have trusted information. If you just go out and you do a Google search and you ask for something like, what do I do for an eviction or what do I do for divorce? You're gonna get all kinds of results. You're gonna start out with the paid results at the top for the people that bought the AdWords. They're gonna be from all over the United States. Uh, it's just not gonna be useful for people to do it that way. So the idea was we wanted to create a site for a jurisdiction or a state that people could go to and know that all of the information there has been vetted, that all the providers there are people that have been vetted by the access to justice community uh, in that locality. And so that was the idea behind Legal Navigator. Now, so many of the websites that we used to have, you started out looking for information just by doing a search term. And you know that's kind of like what you do with Google and it returns so much information and in no particular order that it's not all that useful. So we wanted to do something different with Legal Navigator. For one thing, we did include topic-based navigation because there are a whole bunch of people that just want to drill down from the very beginning. They've got an idea what their legal problem is. They know what they're looking for. And so they want to be able to just go in under the topics and drill down and find that information. So Legal Navigator is designed to allow you to do that. You can set it up just like the, the normal website where people can actually look in information by topics. But we also wanted to do more than just allow people to find things with topics. One of the things that Rebecca Sandifer's research for the ABA years ago did was to show us that a lot of people may have a legal problem and they don't even know it's a legal problem. They just know they have a problem. So the idea behind Legal Navigator's Guided Assistant is to allow people to go in and describe in their own plain words what their problem is. And then using an uh, artificial intelligence engine developed by Suffolk Law School called Spot, we are able to help narrow down what they're actually looking for and possible legal problems associated with what they describe. And when they do that, then we want to provide them with a guided assistant to help them get to the exactly the information that they need. Now, the way that we got started with Spot was that we got some information from Reddit on one of their legal forums where people could come in and ask for uh, you know, answers to legal questions. And anybody could go in and answer the legal questions. But there were a couple of lawyers that were moderators. And we got in touch with them and they gave us something like, I don't know, a couple of hundred thousand inquiries that people had made so that we could start educating the artificial intelligence or the machine learning engine. Now, the way these engines work is by looking for patterns. I mean, we've all read about artificial intelligence and looking for patterns, but they need data. The more data that they get, the better that engine can do. So one of the things that we also did to start educating Spot on legal terminology was to work with Stanford University and they set up a, a, a project called Learned Hands, a very clever play on words that law students and attorneys could sign up and then they could look at some of the questions that people had asked on Reddit and they could classify what those actual legal problems were to help it get smarter and smarter. And the idea is the longer that we use this, the more people that use this, the smarter AI can get. Now, Spot is available to any nonprofit that wants to use it. Other uh, websites are already using it, like the, the Massachusetts Resource Finder uses Spot to return that. And it's based on LIST, which was the uh, next generation of the National Subject Matter Index that we've been using to index legal content on our website for quite some time. So, this is something that we've all been working together on, and I'm hoping that maybe you get an idea of how you might be able to use that or how Legal Navigator might work in your jurisdiction. Now, after they go in and they choose a guided assistant, because there may be three or four that are returned by spot, once they pick the one that's applicable to them, then what we do is we ask them bite-sized questions to be sure that it's right. You can see on the left side here where it talks about, you know, it's a guided assistant interview about evictions. Is this what you were looking for? Do you want to continue? And you can see at the bottom, 
it gave a little snippet about what an eviction is. So you can actually use this interview to begin the education process for whatever their legal topic is. This was built using A2J author, and then it served up inside of Legal Navigator. I gotta go. I guess. Um, we've been working now so that uh, you can also build these interviews with DACA symbol or with legal server. And I think those two projects are just about done so that that would be, you won't be limited to AJ author if you wanted to build these. These use branching logic. This is not part of the AI. I don't want anybody to think that, oh, all you have to do is connect with Spot and then it's gonna do the interviews for you. There's still a lot of work that you have to do to get these interviews right. But the idea is you ask them these bite-sized questions like, are you the landlord? Are you the tenant? And then just take them through just like you would as an attorney or a paralegal interviewing somebody about their legal problem to help you find what kind of information they need uh, to resolve their problem. That's the way that the guided assistant will work. And when you finish with the guided assistant, we want to give you an action plan. These are gonna be the different steps that you need to resolve your particular legal issue. This is an action plan that was returned on the system for divorce separation and annulment. And you can see there's a little plus sign beside each one of those. These expand so that there are multiple things in each one, but we like giving kind of a snapshot to people so that they don't feel completely overwhelmed. They can see, oh, we've got five steps here that I need to do to take care of this. Now, if we divide up one of those like step three, you can see that there's a lot more information in there and you can put link to resources, to videos, to things they should read, to court forms, <laughs> whatever you need to do, you can put those in these action items within each step. And then you can see up at the right-hand corner, they can actually check them off as complete. They don't go away, but they'll show as complete. And so one of the things that you saw in the video is we like the idea that you can take this action plan and share it with a legal aid provider, an attorney that's doing unbundled legal services, or anybody that you actually want to get help, a pro bono attorney that can help you with this problem. And the idea would be if you had six steps there and you completed four of them on your own, but you needed help with two, then it'd be very easy for the person that you're sharing your action plan with to see what you already have learned about this, what you've already done so that they're not wasting your time and their time repeating things that you've already done. And you can either download these or you can print these uh, so that you are able to have this action plan to share with somebody or to refer back to. Now, at this time, we We don't use user accounts. This is uh, you know, identifying information. As they go through that guided assistance, all it's doing is getting to the stage to give them the action plan. We're not creating user accounts. We're not storing that information. In the future, that might be a functionality that we would decide would be good to add to the system to do something like that. But right now, the decision was made to make it where people can be comfortable that what they're doing here is private. And that's also why we want them to be able to download it or to print it so that they won't lose everything that they've done when they've gone through there. All those links, everything like that will be in that action plan. Now, it can have lots of other resources. As I said, this is an aggregator of the resources. As you'll see here, you can have featured resources. These are the ones that you think are the most important. You can have a link to forms. You can have links to the guided assistance, to the organizations that are gonna help them, or to the self-help resources at the court system. This is a way that people don't get overwhelmed, but they can click on the tab and they can drill down in the resources this way so that they see any different type of resource all listed there together but they're not overwhelmed with one big long list that they have to scroll through. And by having the, the featured resources, you can figure out that if somebody's got this legal problem, this is what they're most likely to be looking for. And you can put that into the featured resources. We've done the system using WordPress, which is an open source content management system. 
uh, so that you know there's lots of people out there that can support the system, lots of people know how to use the system. And there's a management console inside of WordPress where you do all this with the content. So you designate what the uh, featured resource is, you designate that when they're looking in this particular area, these are the organizations that are surfaced. And Neilani can give you a lot more details about that when she talks about it, because you know I'm on this from the design and implementation standpoint. Uh, Neilani is on it more from the, we actually use it and here's what we want it to do and how it works type of standpoint. Neilani, uh, I'll let you talk about the recent developments and, and uh, some yeah. of the other features. Thank you, thank you, Glenn. Um, I, Glenn, Glenn shared a, a bunch of the things that are already on this uh, on this chart. Um, the biggest thing that's changed from the start of this development um, of this of Legal Navigator is that it was rebuilt on WordPress, um, so the backend is a heck of a lot easier to use than what it was originally built on. So it is definitely usable for other states and those that may have less technology background in terms of being able to up, up, up in order to update the website. It is a simple login system where you can go in and and it's pretty user friendly. Um, it's user friendly enough, as I always say, that I, as someone who has not been trained in any technology, can go in and make updates. Um, the second thing is that, you know, in the partnership with Alaska court system, what's been great is that having a legal aid partner and then a court system, we have different needs. And so within those needs, there's been lots of doc, uh, lots of discussions about things that we want to be able to turn on and off, but still keep the, the sense of what the site looks like and, and keep some kind of commonality. And so there are definitely increased built in options for display and customization in terms of certain information that you know, that a state may or may not want on their site. So, you know, wanting to share that was one of the things that came out of this partnership and working really closely with Alaska. And Jeannie Sato from um, the Alaska Court Systems is actually also on this call. Um, the next thing is, um, as Glenn talked a little bit about, is that um, we have worked to do integrations with legal server uh, case management system, um, guided navigation, and, and simple justice are also in progress. Um, so there are some opportunities there to potentially have content living in a legal service in a legal services program system that then can directly connect via API um, to the to legal nav and that's something that is in the works right now. Um, we also are looking at a soft launch in the next couple of months. Um, we are getting closer. We're waiting just for a couple of more um, APIs to get cleared with legal server and hopefully we will be there in terms of the soft launch. And yes, it has taken a while for those of you that are following this project um, and lots of lessons learned over the years. Um, the next things that are coming up for us are really the doc assemble integration for building guided assist that we're hoping to start in the next few months. Um, and then we also have, once the site is a little bit more live and gone through soft launch and some initial testing, we are also gonna be working to get what we're calling alternative language uh, switches, which is basically the opportunity to switch the site to another language. Um, if you have languages that you have a lot more materials on and translated materials on. If the site does use Google Translate, we know that there are different opinions about whether Google Translate should be utilized. We do think that Google Translate at least can be a starting point. Um, and part of what we've tried to do is we are trying to put in language there ahead of time so that people know that they should really seek the assistance of a legal service provider um, or contact somebody directly if they speak a language other than English. So again, those are some of the things that are coming up within um, within the pro within Legal Navigator. And we'll be happy to talk um, in just a little bit if you have questions about the program. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of implementing legal navigator in, in your state, you know, Glenn talked a little bit, talked about that it's not intended um, to be a resource provider, but kind of getting resource providers together. Um, you know, resources have to be already available in your state. Um, it is really kind of a way for people to get to those resources. Um, there are lots of materials from the National Center on State Courts around this, around this, but also note that it is Dated and it's pre, you know, it's pre us setting up all of these things. So I would say it's a great place to start, but definitely reach out to different programs or listen to all the various webinars that are happening this summer um, on self-help resources, because I think there's also lots of lessons to be learned from all of the other, um, uh, all of the other portals out there right now. 
Um, governance is gonna be important, especially if you have multiple players um, providing content. Um, in, right currently with both Alaska and Hawaii, we really are the ones that are providing the content. So Legal Aid Society of Hawaii is providing that in Hawaii and the court system is doing it in Alaska um, really as kind of the initial stages. But as you start to look and figure out what you wanna do in the state, knowing who's gonna be in that governance about what content's gonna look like, who can be on the platform will be part of those, should be part of those conversations. And then finally, you know, understanding as part of that, who gets to onboard, right? Who gets to participate on the site, how that actually looks. And again, those are gonna be conversations that'll be important um, depending on your state size and depending on how this is looking for your particular state. Glenn, did you wanna add anything on this? I did, Neilani, a couple of things that, you know, that you covered that I really wanna emphasize people. And the, the first one is the governance body. You really need to decide who's going to be in your state. You know, if you've got a really good active access to Justice Commission, that's a really good place to start because we don't want this to be just a legal aid project or just a court project or just a bar project. We want all the players working together. That's the whole vision behind Legal Navigator is like we said to aggregate all that. And then the reason we, we point you to the, the National Center for State Courts materials is the Public Welfare Foundation several years ago did what they called the Justice for All project. And they gave grants to several states so that they could actually work on planning around providing 100% access to people with civil legal needs. And one of the things that was done for this was a really good inventory guide to help you look at what your existing resources are. Because it's just not right to put up a website like this take people through all the process of the guided assistant. And then when they get to the end, you don't have any resources to support what they were actually looking for. And so this is something that before you start with something like Legal Navigator, you should really do this inventory process to be sure that you've got resources in the areas that you really wanna help people with. Like I said, you know, if they need this particular form, you wanna make sure that form exists. If they're gonna need an explanation in a video, be sure that's all there. And you know, find out where everything is. And so, uh, you know, to me, that that's one of the most important things in making sure you've got all those resources. And like I said, there's really good materials already done uh, for that Justice for All project for the National Center. One of the most important things in starting a project like this as well, you know, in terms of the larger conversation that Glenn, that Glenn just talked about in terms of governance and, and having the right players being involved, you still need to figure out internal support for, for whoever is going to be in charge of this project. There still needs to be people that are going to be content creators and content managers, because while we may have content out there, the content may not be in the format that's going to be that's going to be workable within this particular platform. So it is really important that that's, that's that, that that is there. Um, I say it this way, technically inclined staff, because I don't think you necessarily need, um, you need computer science majors um, or those that have their technology degrees, but you need them to assist in creating the guided assistance to either A2J, legal server, or doc assemble, which will be, you know, ultimately the, the goal by hopefully the end, end of this year, three ways in which you can build guided assistance. Um, you're also going to need technically inclined staff to update the site. While I can do a few things here and there, I think as you want to grow the site or find ways to integrate with other um, with other programs, you're going to need somebody who at least has a sense to be able to do the updates um, on the site on a regular basis. And then finally, which is really critical for all of these programs, is that you, you need to figure out the resources to support the staff and the plate and the platform maintenance costs. With the switch over to WordPress, the platform maintenance cost we really believe is is not that is not that high. Where the where the resources are really going to be spent is supporting the staff in order to maintain the site and ensure that you have ongoing correct content and managing the partnerships that that would that will continue in this pro, in this project. Uh, next slide. Oh, go ahead, Glenn. Well, I was just going to say. I mean, our next slide is the question. But one other thing that I wanted to mention is that. One other thing that has come to my attention that you really want when you start this project is a sustainability plan. That is something that even if you find a Microsoft or an LSC or somebody to give you startup money to get the project up and running, it is something from you know what Neilani was telling you, all those resources that you're gonna need internally, somebody has to provide those. And it really is not a good strategy to give them to existing staff 
that already have full-time jobs. So this is something that I always encourage people from the very beginning of the project to come up with a sustainability plan. Who's gonna be contributing what? Who's gonna pay for the server cost? Who's gonna be uh, paying for the person that actually manages the content? You know, uh, any other hosting fees, whatever. You wanna be sure that somebody has committed to do those so that you don't get a really good project up and running and then it dies. We saw that in one state, New Mexico, where TIG funded this project. We had three, uh, three or four legal services providers working on it together. And then after the project, the there was no sustainability there. And so the project just went away. And that's not what anybody wants to see in this type of an instance. So that's just something that I would point out to you too, is very important to think about from the very start. Don't, don't get to the end of the project and get it implemented and then start worrying about sustainability. So Ange, that's our part of the presentation. We're hoping to get discussions, questions. Um, Neilani, I'm not sure, when is this gonna be available on GitHub, the code for people? We're hoping in the next month, we're waiting on legal server for one of the APIs. Um, so um, the, uh, the consultants are waiting for that. They wanna make sure that everything's uploaded at the same time. Yeah, so it'll be on GitHub so that you could take this and you could download it, put it on whatever servers you wanna run it on and, and get it up and running. And so uh, we're hoping that people will take the platform and use it. That's one of the things that we've always planned on doing because there's so much cost and work that went into the development of this. You know, Microsoft put in a couple of million dollars. A lot of that was in the user testing. Uh, and Pew Charitable Trust also uh, invested money in this to do user testing for us and all. So we feel like it's a good platform. And we're hoping that it gets adopted by more jurisdictions or states to actually use. And, you know, that's why it'll be on GitHub. So there won't be any cost to you for the software. Uh, and there's also a, a, a user management guide for the content management so that you'll have instructions on how to do that as well. So that you know, you're not just starting with a, a piece of software with no instructions. Great, well, thank you both so much for this presentation. Um, we, I think everyone is muted um, just for purposes of having a good presentation, but if you've got questions or um, comments, we would love for you to unmute and ask them or raise your hand or put something in the chat. Any of those options are good, are great. Um, I'll get us started by asking, um, with the action plan, how detailed do you get in that action plan? And I ask, um, as uh, Michigan Legal Help, we sometimes struggle um, with what level of detail to get into because with action plans, you get into like jurisdiction specific nuances, shall we say. And so I was just you know, like wondering uh, how you're handling that. Um, I guess this is probably for Nalani, but uh, if Glenn has ideas as well, it would be great to hear them. It's an, it's a it's a great question, Angela, because I think um, Alaska and Hawaii do it differently, and I think that's 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 one of the neat things about the platform, right? Is is that we've kept it really at a much like just a, a few simple questions, so that it kind of gets people to the right forms, or at least gets people started. Um, so we will ask things like, do you have children so that we provide information in a divorce to provide information about what happens with custody and things like that. On the Alaska side, and, and I, I really do invite Jeannie to jump in since she is on the call, they've been very specific about how to fill out particular court forms and the information that you need. So like, I think the slide that you saw where there was detailed information about what you needed, what information you needed from your spouse, that's one of the things that, um, that Alaska has been doing with it. Um, I think the question really goes to, again, the point that there's so much flexibility within the, within the platform for states to decide how they want to utilize um, the guided assist. And again, I think there's just, there can be different, many different approaches. Um, and I think it's one of the things that we're curious about in terms of, you know, what, what feedback is going to be um, on, on the different approaches for what, what people are seeing. And it was some of the things that were initially tested and people were excited about even the different approaches, right? I think, again, it just depends on what your state and what your state resources are. And that's going to be the questions 
that your state is going to have to answer for itself as to what they want to use it for. Let me let me just add one other thing on that. And and um, Angie is that the way that I think it really also depends on your conceptualization of what the site is for, right? We at least I believe in how we've approached the site is that it it will not be able to replace assistance for, for the most complicated cases, right? For those that have more barriers. And so we really, we wanted to be really at a much, you know, kind of like, you know, simple place to get people to the right resources as a, as a starting place and not necessarily so detailed on like figuring out that jurisdiction question because there's so much nuance in that particularly when you, when you raise the, the, the point about the jurisdiction question. Again, I don't, and I don't think Alaska goes into that that far either. I think it's just really about how do you fill out the forms and, and what's the information that you need. So I think we always want to keep that in mind. And I think we try to keep that in mind, at least with the design of, of, of what the guided assist walks people through. It's really trying to get people to the right forms that they need, the right information, or at least thinking about the right legal questions that they need to answer before they even get started. I don't know, Jeannie, do you, are you able to unmute and share? Sorry, I don't want to talk over you. <laughs> no, no, no put problem. On the spot. <laughs> no, no. Um, I think it's a really interesting question. And um, our administrative director and I actually just spoke with the New Mexico Access to Justice team about our self-help services. And I think for our family law interviews, we were trying to be more detailed and, and pretty, um, we have a, a group of phone facilitators who answer family law questions, and we tried to somewhat duplicate what a phone call would be like with some more detailed questions and then more detailed answers in the family law realm. And I, I think part of that is we have a lot of family law resources, and for a, a more sophisticated user, they can probably go to our website and find them. And then maybe the next level user hopefully could go through the interview and get some pretty detailed answers in their action plan kind of through the steps they need to go to. But that would be someone who was comfortable with reading and, and you know having all the steps, but we would still have the in-person option for people who maybe learn better through listening or, or having a discussion. I think for some of, it would be each, each um, agency that would wanna use it could pick what level they want to do. But we did try to see it as a um, artificial intelligence discussion or interview with the hopes that it would be like at the end would be similar to what you would be told if you were talking to a person that's kind of our ultimate goal although in some subject matter areas there's maybe just not as much detail as there would be in family law and it will be they will be not quite as detailed uh, and the um concern that i think we have and that anyone would have that glenn mentioned is you then need staff to um update all that and so that's also a decision you have to make based on resources and how much staff you have to maintain it post building the interviews. Um, and I, I do think Nailani mentioned, and she's so right, you do need tech savvy staff. And I think you also need folks, there are some really good lawyers who maybe aren't, or, or people with legal background who aren't, um, maybe logic and logic trees and that sort of thinking isn't their strength. And that's a pretty important skill for someone who's gonna be building the interview, someone who enjoys kind of logic puzzles. Um, so, but I think, yeah, Nailani, I think you did a great job describing the difference between the two jurisdictions. And I think we also looked out because Alaska and Hawaii, we've been meeting once a week for about four years and we're um, get along very well. So we like that we have great team members. Great, thank you both. Um, how about others on the call? Are you thinking about trying to implement this in your state? Do you have questions? Rochelle, I see you unmuted. Yeah. Be interested in knowing what the interplay is between your portal and your legal help site, um, especially if your law help site has a lot of content already and maybe it has fillable forms and it has, and then the portal also has, it seems like the portal also has like a built out directory. So where would, how, do people get confused going back and forth between the two sites or when, is there content like content that would live on one site and not the other site or how do you avoid the duplication? Yeah, so the way that the, the platform actually works is that it actually connects to whatever the other platform is. So right now, any resources that we have on Law Help will connect in through, in through the portal. So it's the same, so it's the, it's the website address, right, for whatever document is on Law Help. Um, so you could do that kind of interplay. So you could have, if you had, the, if you use the legal port, if you use Legal Navigator as the portal, you could still have Law Help um, as, 
in the background to, you know, to host all of your materials. It, this would just be a different interface that you could then also maybe connect to other, you know, to the court's website or to other or other community websites that you have. So I think as Glenn talked about it, right, it's it, the idea is that it can be kind of an aggregator or, uh, you know, it's, it's the entry point for legal for legal information for your state that might connect all of these different platforms. With that said, in our state, our plan is actually to move, is to actually go get off of law help. And we're gonna be utilizing um, simple justice through the um, through legal server to connect a lot of our resources up as a very different way of approaching. And so we will likely be off the entire law help platform and just have this platform as being kind of the connecting place for for a lot of our resources. So I think it's gonna depend on what states wanna to decide to do. This is a choice that, that we made just because we didn't wanna to have to, I didn't wanna to have to um, update materials in multiple places. And what we're, and again, what the thing that we're working on to get into GitHub is really the API information so that once we update um, content in, um, in Simple Justice, which is again, a legal server um, platform, it'll automatically update it, um, update the API in the, on Google Navigator. So those are the kinds of things that at least we've been trying to think through. So I think it just really, it's gonna depend on the state. And Alaska is actually doing a, a different approach that I think would be another option for states or people who are interested in the platform. We have a very robust website already. So on those featured, when it, Glenn showed a screen that had the featured resources tab and actually the screen he showed, the first featured resource was Alaska court system information on, I can't remember if it was debt or housing. Um, so we're using that as a featured resource. So if someone goes to the resources page, we're directing them back to our website. So like Neilani, that's our solution to only have to maintain one source. And we're putting very few resources on that page and just getting people to our web page, which we're maintaining. And then we're focusing on the interview building in Alaska um, to be something, an add to our web page is through the interview building, the guided assistant. And when you click on an external resource, Rochelle, it, it opens up a new tab. It doesn't do it in that same window. So then people can close out that tab and still be where they were in their action plan. We didn't want people having to move back and then hit the back button to get back to where they were type of thing. So. Other questions? I guess if no one has any, I'll ask another. Um, do you have any learnings from the spot integration that you would like to share? Um, I think, you know, that's for many organizations that are looking at doing that or it's new. And so um, any guidance? I'll, I'll let Glenn talk about the technical side of it. Um, we've had we've had things happen. <laughs> um, I just tested it this morning and it was actually doing a much better job. So I think as we've always said, right, as it learns, it it gets better and better and better. Um, so I think it it is an opportunity, but there is still a need, um, at least on on our side, to put in keywords, right? It's still critical for the search patterns and, and everything else. So I think Spot is learning and there's opportunities. One of the things that we saw that we know is really true is that the way that Spot works requires more than just two words. And we're so trained with our Google searching to just put in like, you know, divorce, right? Versus like, um, my husband just told me that he wants to kick me out. And so I think that's one of the things that it's going to be interesting to see how people use it because if they don't type in more of a, story, um, then I, 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 we have seen we have seen some issues with Spot, which is why we have the keywords as also an added search feature. But I'll let Glenn talk a little bit more about the technical side, because I think he was working more closely on that. Well, and the other thing, and as you probably know, we're not where we want to be so that we're sending back any results to Spot, which is where we really need to get to get it educated. In other words, we send them to Spot, Spot looks at the engine, sends them back to us, but when somebody clicks on something, we need to be able to send that back to Spot to say, ah, you know, when you send back these three results with this question, nine times out of 10, they click this one. Spot gets smarter and knows 
that should be at the top of the list type of thing. We're not really there for that. We have designed it as, you know, Neilani said though, it will also look at your keywords in that you've indexed with the each resource in WordPress so that you don't have to depend solely on spot. It, you know, if you've got something really unique that spot's not returning, and but you put in that keyword in your WordPress, then it will also look at that and find that resource as well. So it's not a one or the other. You can actually do both of those keywords and that. And right now too, if I remember right, the um, Lewis only goes down to, um, not Lewis, look, list only goes down to the second level. And so that needs to get more robust so that people can drill down further into uh, different legal categories as such. So, but you know, it, it's an evolution. And, you know, that's why they call it machine learning. The more that this does, the more that'll work. And David Colarusso and his group have been very um, responsive when you know issues have arisen or something like that. Okay, thanks. I had another question. As part of this project, you guys did all this great user testing, and I know that you've incorporated the results of the user testing into your into what you designed. But I'm wondering, is there any opportunity, like, are any of those reports just available to see or to share out with the community? I feel like so many states are doing user testing, but we don't necessarily see what 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 they find. It would be so helpful for the as we're all upgrading and making changes to see what other tests have happened? I don't recall whether we've ever published any of those. Um, Rochelle, I'm, I'm, you know, that was something that you know, was done uh, by Ignition72 initially and then Pew did some. Pew is getting ready to release some of their evaluation uh, materials that they did. And they did a presentation too on this at Equal Justice Conference where they looked at not just Legal Navigator, but several of the other portals and Legal Navigator. So, um, Neilani, do you remember, have we ever published any of the Ignition 72 work? It was very specific. Right. And I think that's the thing, right? I think the reports were so specific as to like, did this did, did the placement of this work here, right? I mean, which I which I can hear which I can hear from you actually could be useful, right, for other programs. So maybe it's something for us to think a little bit more about. And I'm gonna I'm looking at Angie going, maybe it's something to work with Ellison Tap on in terms of like, I mean, you know, aggregating, right? Not just for our portal, but for other sites, right? What are the things that work and don't work so that, you know, so that programs across the country aren't struggling with the same, same design, you know design quote unquote, I'm not saying flaws, but I mean, but issues questions. right that users come up with. <laughs> the same design questions because questions, you know, we, right, we right. all have, I bet we do have very similar questions in the end, you know, like mm -hmm. do buttons work best at the top or the bottom? You know, how many right. buttons is too many? Is our pop-ups good or bad or when are they good or bad? So yeah. that's a great question, Rochelle, and a great idea, Nalani, to, to share more of that. Well, and a lot of what it, it, it surfaced too was accessibility problems that we needed to correct. You know, getting, I forget what the terminology is now. I'd never heard of it before, but we didn't have it. And so it was something that you needed in there and then going in, if you've got any pictures and, you know, doing the tagging those right and all that. So that helped us a lot with accessibility too. Yeah. I mean, to that, I mean, one of the interesting findings, which I think we had never thought about was that when you have a banner button on the top and the bottom, right, it repeats for the person that has accessibility, right, so that it actually is more problematic to have the same information on, on the page, right, even though for quote unquote prettiness or user design, right, we think it looks kind of nice to be able to have people accessing the information both at the bottom of the page and the top of the page. So we removed the banner that allowed for access on the bottom of the page. Um, so there were, I mean, there were small things like that, that I think, uh, you know, as you ask the question, I mean, they're great questions because not sure, maybe that is standard, you know, non-design for everybody else on this call, but it was a lesson that, that we learned, right? With that accessibility testing. I think some of the information too, maybe, I don't know if there's a report or not, the ideation workshops that they did where people identified what was so important to them, it was amazing to me how um, similar they were both in Hawaii and Alaska. And one of the things that we tried to do with this is look at three different user groups. 
not just the end user that's trying to, to do their own divorce, but also the people that are the legal navigators in their community. They're the trusted advisors. Uh, and, you know, for example, in Alaska, one of the people that came to the workshop was from the post office there because the only government building anywhere close to that community was the post office. So anybody who had a problem came in and asked the postmaster there how to solve that problem. So one of the things we wanted to do with Legal Navigator is to be sure that the community navigators that are, that are helping these people would be able to use the system as well to help get these people to the right information that they needed. And then we want to make it good for the providers because you know, they're the other user group. They're the ones that want to surface their information. So we tried to be attuned to that. And so those were really, those were two day workshops in each state. And they were really interesting to me. They overlap in what people wanted with the trusted information. They want to be sure that their identity was safe. Uh, they wanted you know, the resources that would really help them. You know, it, it was a, an interesting uh, experience. It also showed me that, you know, this is what Margaret Hagen's been saying forever. Before you start building the software, bring your users in and see what they want. Don't guess what they want and then bring them in to look at it. All right, any other, any other questions or comments? You've got our contact information. If anything occurs to you later or you just didn't want to say it in front of the group, you can reach out to us. So, yep. Thank Excellent. you. Well, thanks thank for the you. opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nalani and Glenn, for um, coming uh, together today to talk about Legal Navigator. Um, just as a reminder, uh, we do have, um, let's see, three more websites left in our summer self help series. Um, they are uh, every Thursday at 3 p.m. for the next three weeks. We, next week, we have statewide self-help websites 2.0. Um, learn about a couple. Learn, we're going to hear from a couple of programs who are doing re, rebuilds and relaunches of websites that have been around for 10 or more years. Um, then next up is a user-centered design and self-help websites uh, webinar. Um, we'll, we'll be hearing from Graphic Advocacy Project um, talking about the fundamentals of the UX design process. And then finally, um, the last webinar is called Not Another Form, Innovative Self-Help. Self so uh, other tools besides document assembly um, that are uh, being used creatively to um, help provide legal self-help assistance. So I hope you will join us for those webinars. As always, they will be recorded and available on lsntap.org. And I'll see you next Thursday.